Pesky pellet problems? Here's some tips for how you can become a superstar of the supernatant. So a lot of times in the lab, we like spin things down to pellet things out. So we stick tubes filled with stuff into a centrifuge, spin it really, really fast, and stuff that is insoluble and stuff that's large and like suspended and stuff, um, it's going to come out and into a pellet at the bottom, whereas everything else is going to stay um, suspended in the liquid or dissolved in the liquid. And we call that liquid part the supernatant. We can use this in order to separate things based on their like solubility and their mass and their size and things like that. But once we separate them, we need to like physically separate them, like some separate that supernatant from the pellet. And there are different ways to do this. And sometimes you actually like lose your pellet or your supernatant in the process. And so it can be a pain. So here are some tips for helping you do this successfully without like mix, remixing them in the process or losing your pellet when you're and not being able to find it and various things. So for, speaking of where to find it, depending on what type of centrifuge rotor you're using, your pellet will be in different places. So if you are using um, a fixed angle centrifuge where the tubes are held at a fixed angle, what's going to happen is that the centrifugal force um, where it's actually like the pushing, helping push the molecules, it's going to make it so that those things that you're pelleting out are going to end up like on tip on the top outer edge so like at the bottom this like bottom corner type of thing um and so if it's in one of these tubes it's kind of going to be like a blob right here if however you're using a swinging bucket centrifuge here your things the tubes during the run are going to actually like be sideways um and so often we're using these when we're doing like um we have various centrifuges that we use with these swinging buckets and these are going to go sideways what's going to happen now is that that force is going to push things to the very bottom when it's in a conical tube it's nice because you have everything kind of just like collect in this cone um if you have a tube like this like when you're pelleting down cells trying to remove those cells from the media the food that they're growing in remove that media um, and keep the cells um, is often what we're doing um, and in this case your pellet is going to be on the bottom of the tube rather than like on the side of the tube so sometimes it can actually be kind of hard to find the pellet which is kind of seems that silly when you're talking about like pelleting down like cell culture um, and you end up with these big gloopy glumps um, that you can totally see with your eye but other times when you're trying to pellet out really tiny stuff it can be hard we know where to expect it because of um, if we know where to put which way we put the tubes in so it's helpful to always put your tubes in the same orientation so I typically put them so that the cap is when, with like a macro centrifuge tube I put them all so that the cap is like straight out um, and I do this with all the tubes and now I know that I should expect the pellet to be right here and what happens is when you take it out, you can actually, because the pellet's going to be a different size depending on how, how much is there, you can actually like outline your pellet, kind of like one of those like crime scene things, like outline the pellet so that you know exactly where it is. Um, if you are dealing with a tube that um, doesn't have like a line or thing, you can just line it up based on the writing on the tube so that you know where to expect your pellet. Um, and then again, for one of these, it's not an issue though with the that's only with the fixed angle with the swinging bucket it's always going to be on the very bottom and so that that's that um but you can still might need to mark it if it's a small pellet so then how you see the pellet and now your job is to get the liquid off the pellet without actually disrupting um the pellet itself because well you just centrifuged it so that you could separate them and now oh, if okay, you okay. don't do anything they're going to mix back together potentially. Sometimes these pellets, depending on what you're pelleting out, they're going to be really tight and firm and those are a lot easier to work with. Other times they're going to be all loosey-goosey and then it can be really hard to pour off this or take out the supernatant without actually disrupting the pellet. Um, sometimes the pellet doesn't stick very well to the wall of the tube. There are various things um, and so you need to be careful. So first you identify where the pellet is and now you need to get the liquid away from it um, without disrupting it. So sometimes we're wanting to keep that liquid or that supernatant. Other times we're wanting to keep the pellet. Either case, um, sometimes we want both. So you need to know what you're going after um, and Make sure that you're not disposing of the supernatant if you need it or the pellet if you need it if you're not sure um, or if you you can keep both um, and it's always a good idea to keep both anyway until the end um, just to make sure that the thing that you 
that it is the place where he thought it was. So maybe it didn't tell it out, and so it's in the supernate still. Um, and so if you keep that supernate, and then you can test and see, oh, it is in the supernate still. Or maybe it you expected your protein to be soluble and still not liquid, um, but what happened was it got insoluble, and so it was with that pelleted gunk. Um, and so you can test the pellet and see that it's in the pellet. Um, so it's always a good idea to keep both, um, at least when practical, or, and especially when you're doing an experiment type of experiment for the first time. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually get that liquid off? The easiest way is like literally just like pour it off. Um, so this has worked really well if you have a really firm pellet um, and it's going to be fast. So it's less, the less of a risk of the pellet and the supernatant like mixing back together just because they're like sitting there and things diffuse and move around. Um, but you have the most, you have a risk of actually like pouring out your pellet when you're doing it. Um, and so you want to be really, really careful when doing this um, and that you're not actually going to lose the pellet. Sometimes there's like a lid on, like a lip on here, and if you do it carefully, if there's, if the pellet starts moving, you can still like kind of catch her on the lip up here. Um, and so this, we call this decanting, or just like pouring that liquid off. Um, and so you can decant it off into a beaker or another tube or that sort of thing. When you're doing this, you're typically still going to need to follow it up with the next method, aspiration. Um, and sometimes you just start with the aspiration. And aspiration sounds like this like scary word, but really it's just like pipetting things off. Um, so we can, depending on how much volume you're pipetting off, you might be with like a micro pipetter. It might be um, with a pipette man, um, with a serological pipette. Or it could be with an aspirating pipette, which is basically like one of these, except it's smaller, typically like two mils or so, um, and it doesn't have a filter. Um, and since it doesn't have a filter, what you can do is you can attach it to a vacuum line um, and then actually suck it out. Um, typically, we're sucking it out into a waste, though, so you wouldn't want to use this if you are trying to keep that super nascent. We use aspirating pipettes a lot, um, like in cell culture, when we are removing media from like dishes of cells and things like that. And then we can pipette all that like biohazard waste into a waste container that gets bleached. When you're using one of these aspirating um, pipettes with like the vacuum, be really, really careful that you're not actually, touch you don't like actually accidentally like touch your pellet with the vacuum because it's gonna suck it up. Hopefully it's gonna suck it up. Um, so what can happen is sometimes like the tubing, it's not like, if you're at an angle, it's not actually gonna suck it up well. So you might have to like kind of suck it up and then move it, suck it up and then like help it, help, help it out, help that vacuum out depending on how good your vacuum is and things like that. Sometimes it could be easier to actually, instead of using one of those long aspirating pipettes, stick like a one mil tip um, on the end of the vacuum line um, and suck it up that way. Um. But the basic idea is you just want to remove that liquid um, and you want to remove it as quickly as possible. So again, you don't get that resuspension between the solid um, pellet and the liquid supernatant. Often you're starting with one of these like bigger tools, but it's not going to um, do the full job if you use one of these tools that has a bigger that has a bigger tip. So if like if you start with a one mil so that you can get up all the volume, or if you start with one of these so you can get up all the volume, often there's going to be especially with when you're working with small volumes, there's going to be a little bit of liquid left over. So then you can take a smaller pipette which has a finer tip um, to get that last of the stuff. This can be really really important when you're doing things like those RNA and DNA extractions where things like isopropanol or ethanol might mess up a further step, um, and so. This is, um, it's important to get that last of the liquid. And then also when you're doing the pouring off, when you like pour it back, now there's gonna be a bunch of liquid probably, or not a bunch, but some liquid. Um, and then you can aspirate that liquid out. So another thing to help with this prevent it resuspending by itself is when you're taking tubes out of the centrifuge, leave them in the centrifuge, like for one of those fixed angles, leave them at the angle that they're at. Um, and as long as there's no one behind you, like in line waiting behind you for the centrifuge, just like take it out one at a time. Actually take your pipette over if you're doing aspirating, take it your pipette over to the centrifuge um, and remove the liquid there, like take them out one at a time remove the liquid carefully, not disrupting the pellet. Um, and when you take your tubes out, like hold them at the angle that they're at. So the pellet, it's not gonna like move, move. Because if you take your tube that's been like this and the pellet is like right here, and now you take that tube like this and you stick them in your tube rack, well now what's gonna happen is your that pellet is gonna kind of migrate if it's not firmly stuck on there. Um, and it can start resuspending. And so what you want to do is instead, take the pellet, take the tubes out like one at a time. When you take it out, hold it at the angle it was at, remove that liquid um, and dispose of that liquid um, and do this for each of your tubes individually. Um, 
one at a time rather than just like sticking them all in your tube rack and walking back to your bench unless people are waiting um, but hopefully there's no people waiting in line so once you aspirated the liquid now if you wanted that liquid if you wanted the supernatant you can do whatever the heck you want with it um, what if you wanted that pellet um, so there are different things that we do with this pellet next but typically you're not just gonna like leave the pellet in the bottle you're often going to like resuspend it so basically get it you took it out of one liquid and now you want to put it in another liquid so notice this is like a wash step so um, or sometimes you do a wash without actually like resuspending the pellet so you just like carefully like rinse it off without disrupting that pellet again um, other times what you're doing is you're actually like resuspending the pellet in some other liquid um, and then you either like spin it back down to remove that liquid and then you resuspend it in something else that you want it um, because rem like that thing I was talking about where there's can be stuff in the supernatant that you really want to get away from it and so the more of this times that you do this the more you're like diluting out that stuff that you're trying to get rid of because even though you like pet, pet it out there's still a little bit of liquid always left over um, but so if you want the pellet now you need to resuspend the pellet which is just like getting it into a suspension in another liquid um, and the one that you like actually want. So these are just what, what we typically do is we just like pipette up and down um, depending on the volume of your sample. Um, yeah, just like pipetting up and down. Um, sometimes depending on how firm your, your pellet is and things like this, it can be hard and it can need some help. Um, so with, with like when we're doing like bacterial like pellets or whatever and then we're trying to like wash our culture um, often what I do is like stick it on a vortexer, which like shakes it and helps it resuspend. Um, another thing, if you have like a really small, like really tight pellet, you can stick it in like a sonicating bath for a few seconds. Um, and what we often do with uh, ultra centrifuge tubes is if you have a pellet on here, you can actually like scrape it against the um, Beppendorf rack. That's going to help break up the pellet into smaller pieces that then the water can do it or the liquid, the liquid can like do its thing and help it re-dissolve or resolubilize, uh, or sorry, like re-suspend. So we're talking about like things like when you're precipitating DNA or RNA during an extraction or purification, where you take that DNA or you RNA and you add like isopropanol to get it to come out of solution. So now it's undissolved, but it's still in like in suspension. It's like floating around in your liquid um, because these pieces are really, really tiny. Um, and they have like the buoyancy from the liquid and they have the friction um, you're going to need to help gravity out um, by applying the centrifugal force to push them out into your pellet. But because this force is going to depend, like the force that you need is going to depend on how big the thing is that you're trying to pellet out. And this is why we can take advantage of different sizes of, and masses of molecules in order to like differentiate the differentiate, differential centrifuge them or whatever, like separate them. Like the faster you spin, the smaller the stuff that you can get out. Um, to make it easier to actually get these things out, we often add like a co-precipitant. Um, so with DNA and RNA, we can add this thing called glycoblue, which is glycogen that's attached to a dye. This is going to bind to that DNA and RNA, um, and it's going to help it get bigger so it can get pulled out more easily. And because it's attached to a dye, it's going to look blue when you're actually going to be able to see it. Um, so that can be really, really helpful. And even if it's not dyed, it can still increase, help it pellet and then increase the size of the pellet so you can actually see it. Um, in order to, so we, those are the basic things um, when working with pellets. Um, so remember to find your pellet, know where to find your pellet. Um, so orient your tubes in a way that you're going to know where the pellet should be. Look and see where the pellet is. Do, remove the supernatant either by decanting, um, so pouring off, by aspirating, removing it with a pipette. Um, and then do that with making sure that you're not actually disrupting the pellet and that you do it quickly so that you're not actually allowing it to resuspend um, by itself.